Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, wow. This is a packed and enthusiastic room, I can see. Um, I'm Samantha Barry. I'm the editor-in-chief at Glamour. And I'm here to talk to these two amazing leading women about women in charge and how we can really create equal opportunities when we're talking about women in business and leadership and on board. Sitting next to me is Dina Powell McCormack. She's a partner at Goldman Sachs, which she rejoined after serving as the US Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy in 2017 and 2018. Um, at Goldman Sachs, she also was led and was the president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation and has done amazing work for women in business, including 10,000 women and 10,000 small business, which we'll get to in a little while. And we've also got Dr. Dambisa Moyo, who's an economist and really a leader in macro economy and global affairs. She serves on the boards of many big global companies, including Barclays Bank, and Barrick Gold. Thank you for joining us, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So the, sta the state of affairs on women in leadership, in business, on boards, how would you sum it up at the moment in 2020? Where are we, Dina? Well, I guess I would start by saying thank God for extraordinary leaders like Dion von Furstenberg. <laughs> And I really mean that. I, I think the voices of women in business are so critical right now, uh, and especially the voices of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, so much of our efforts are rightly spent on demanding that women have a seat at the table, the corporate table, the boardroom table, the business table. But I really believe that we have to start focusing on women having a seat at the entrepreneurial table. And we're not really going to see the change that we want if we don't see more incredible female entrepreneurs who hire more women, who invest, and who frankly then have the platform to do so much more. In 2007, we launched 10,000 Women at Goldman Sachs, which at the time was the largest ever private sector investment in the economic empowerment of women. And candidly, it was just based on numbers, which was a very good thing. It was based on a report called Womenomics that found that greater labor force participation by women in developing and developed economies would hugely impact GDP growth around the world. And suddenly, the men took notice of that. <laughs> and I have often said, and Dion has heard me say this, that as much as we must fight for the protection of women and girls, for the empowerment of women, talking about it as a human rights issue, which it is, as a justice issue, which it is, until we can also talk about it as just smart economics, we won't move the ball as forward as we want to. And so I think we're on the right path. I think we're making great strides. And I think that we are at a t have been at a tipping point moment that I believe is about to really go over the edge. Um, you're, you're at a company which announced, kind of put a line in the sand earlier, uh, late last year, um, and your CEO said that you, Goldman Sachs would not IPO a company unless there was representation of women on the board. How has that been for business? <laughs> you know the answer. Uh, well, actually, David Solomon, our CEO, made a bold move uh, in January, and he announced, um, as Samantha said, that Goldman Sachs will no longer take any company public that does not have a diverse board member. And um, <laughs> thank you. And you would think that that wasn't such a big announcement, um, but it actually was, and Dambisa knows this well, serving on so many incredible boards, but there are so many private companies that are all white male board members right now, and I think very respectfully we want to work with our clients to really make the case that if you want to go to market today, you, you need half of society cheering you on as well and diverse members of the community, and so it's really just in the best business case interest of our clients. That's great. Dambisa, you are on a lot of boards. What's the advice for the women in the room if they want to be in leadership positions, if they want to set themselves up for success? What do they need to do to knock down those doors? Well, um, first of all, thank you, Diane. Um, you are such an inspiration. Um, as I was saying to Sam yesterday, you are a pioneer. I mean, we are sort of riding on the back of your coattails. You were there far beyond any of us. So thank you so much. And I'm really delighted to be here. Um, 
So I, I feel like with most of these stories, we need to give a little bit of context. I was born and raised in Zambia, um, Southern Africa, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, I was born in, in 1969, and I unfortunately have to tell you my age, and I turned 51 a few weeks ago. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because at the time of my birth, um, blacks were not issued birth certificates. That changed in 1974 in my country. So I'm telling you this because in my short 50 years, I then ended up going to Harvard. I worked, I worked at um, Goldman Sachs for about 10 years. I did a PhD in economics at Oxford. I now serve on additional boards, um, Chevron and 3M, who are making the masks um, that are trying to combat. It's important. Hey, people hate I'd say that stock has gone up a lot in recent days. Yes. <laughs> um, but I asked if she had any extras. Yes. <laughs> Not in my handbag, but I can hook you up, girl. Um, but, but the point being that in a very short span of time, you can go from being not recognized as a human being to sitting and really influencing many of the world's largest things. So, now, I'm not here to brag about that. The point of the matter is I'd like to share with you what I think are the three guiding principles that have made it possible for me to have such a transformative life. Um, the first one is no does not mean never. It means not now. Um, I think we're too, too sensitive to doors being slammed in our faces and thinking, well, that's the end of the world. No, it's not. I have had numerous no's, and, and sometimes the no's even come from my own head. I'm a, well, I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm from Africa, I'm from a small country, and there's a whole list of things um, that could have been hurdles. But it doesn't mean never, and I cannot tell you how many times, um, you know, 10 years ago, somebody said, no, not never going to happen. And then 10 years later, I find myself actually doing exactly what I was told I couldn't do. So don't give up. It does not mean never. It just means not now. Um, the second thing is we have to embrace feedback. Um, and I mean that um, very, very um, uh, sort of in a very powerful way. Um, we are living in a world where, unfortunately, um, I think the people who continue to have a disproportionate amount of power um, 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 are getting more discouraged about giving us the critical feedback that we need in order for us to progress. Um, and so I look at my own career and my own experiences, really there have been a lot of people who don't look like me, older white men not from Africa who have been instrumental in my career. But part of that is that I've had to say to myself, I've had to have the temerity to say, you know what, I need to encourage these people to give me critical feedback. A lot of the times I didn't really want to hear it. But I, you know, I send chocolates to people who I don't even agree with. They give me feedback I don't agree with, but I send them a, you and know, you, you, chocolates. You seek it out, right? Yeah, you, absolutely. You, ask you for have it. to, because you will not know why you're not getting promoted or why you're not getting funded. Or you need to get out there and say, "Listen, Bob or John or whoever it is," um, you know, and say, "No, I, I really mean it." You've got to be able to give them the comfort to give you that critical feedback. Otherwise, you won't make it. And then the last thing is. Thank God we're living in 2020, because really, I mean, if we look back, and I know Diane has tons of stories, I'm sure, about how many doors were slammed in her face, and I'm sure, D um, you know, um, Dean and I are probably closer in, in generation, but I'll tell you, the 80s and the 90s, they were damn hard. I, you know, serving on, uh, on these boards, um, for many years I was the only woman in the boardroom. Um, you know, very often people say, well, of course, you know, you're on the boardroom because you're black and you're a woman, and I'd have to say, actually, no, it's because I have a PhD in economics from Oxford, a master's from Harvard, and I'm more educated and experienced than you are. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, but the point being is we are living at a time where people are going to be, um, there's a predisposition to give us a chance. And when the phone call comes to you, you better be prepared. Do not sit around and think, oh gosh, well, people should feel sorry for me or somehow give me a pass because I'm a woman or because I'm black or because I'm Africa. They're, your competition is sitting right next to you. So my advice to you is that the world's moved on. You've heard what Dina said about the large corporates and what they're doing. This is the time now to go back and ask yourself, do you understand what's going on in the markets? What's the cost of capital? What's going to happen in terms of investment? Which is what we're talking about. And then, of course, we started talking about Diane's dresses and how much we love them. But please invest in your careers. Invest in continuous learning. It, the bar is getting higher, and that's fantastic for the world and trying to solve problems. But don't think that anybody's going to cut you any slack or feel sorry for you because of something that you didn't actually choose. You told me that if you want to be a woman in business, one of the easiest things you can do immediately that a lot of women don't do, have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. 
Thank you. And like know what's the happening in the Prime. world of markets and, yeah. and stock. You wanted well, to add something? Yeah, that's what the CEOs are asking. I mean, my phone is ringing off the hook. The CEO from 3M is saying, what should we do? Should we sell masks at cost? Should we give them out for free? I mean, these are real issues. You know, how much does that mean in terms of lost employees? I mean, De uh, Dina can, can talk, and as Deanne as well, can talk a lot about how business and entrepreneurs are dealing with this. But these are the questions that we have to ask. Very good points. Dina, you wanted to add something? Well, I, I so agree with those three principles that Dambisa laid out, and I would add a fourth. You know, I'm sitting here, and it just struck me that all three of us are immigrants. Mm -hmm. Dion is an immigrant. I'm from Cairo, Egypt, and uh, my family left when I was a, a young girl. We immigrated to Dallas, Texas. Uh, they would often say uh, to my sisters and I, uh, Dina, Dahlia, and Denise, we left our homeland so you could pursue your dreams, anything you want to be, as long as you're a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. <laughs> And I'm not a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. Um, but I, I kind of had to, you know, make my own way, knowing that I was taking big risks. And so the fourth principle, I believe, is take risk. It is so scary. And women, understandably, um, hesitate to take a new career path, to try something. But I'm so struck by looking at the great leaders of our time, and every single one of them had an enormous failure in their life. And so giving yourself the permission to know that I'm taking this risk, and I might fail, but maybe failure is what's really going to help me find my purpose. I couldn't agree more. And I think to your point about failure and constructive criticism, we, sometimes we don't seek it out. And I think it's important. One of the best bosses I've ever had was my editor-in-chief when I was at CNN, Meredith Artley. And I remember one day she sat down with me and she, she talked to me about my career in three ways. And it's something I use now with my team. And it, she just said, you need to keep doing this, stop doing this, and start doing this. And it was so simple. <laughs> What she was like, keep doing this, this is great, stop doing this, this is not working for you, and start doing this because this is how you grow. And it was just this very simple piece of advice that I now, as a, a, a leader, take when I'm uh, talking to, to my team at Glamour. Um, let's talk about this, where we think the opportunities are for women in, in, in business and leadership. Uh, many of you may have seen Fortune came out with a kind of disappointing result um, this uh, past week, that in 2019, yes, the VC funding for women-led businesses, it grew. It grew. It's now, in, um, I think, 3.7 billion, but that's only 2.9% of VC funding uh, investment. And more money was given to WeWork than all of the female-founded companies combined. Combined. So in the same report, though, there was some really nice bright spots. It's the female-led unicorns. It talked about Away and Glossier and Rent the Runway. Where do you think the opportunities are? You talk, both of you, this is for both of you. You talked about, is it across all industries? Where do you think the tipping point is really happening? Financial services, which you both have worked extensively in, still seems not to be in a place where it should be with women in leadership. Where are the industries we should be tapping into? So, you know, I tend, I'm an Aquarius, which means I'm always positive and I always think about the, the glass being half full. Um, and so, yes, we can sit here and bemoan these statistics. Um, but and on the other hand, there's so much happening that I think is so positive in terms of women. We are definitely not there uh, yet, but we are, we've made enormous progress. If you just look at the past 10 years, and, uh, you know, I'm a big soccer fan. I love tennis as well, but I'm a big soccer fan, and if you go back to the 2010 uh, um, uh, soccer, uh, uh, soccer competition, World Cup. Um, at that time, I believe it was 10, 2010, um, but you had the president of the winning country, as it was a woman, um, Angela Merkel, the, country, the, the president of the number two country, Argentina, was Kirchner, a woman, and it was being hosted in a country which was at a woman president, it was in Brazil. Um, and so I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And then you look at the corporations at the very um, senior levels, we've had women CEOs of companies that we, we would traditionally think of as being quite male, mining companies, 
old technology, new technology, automotives. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, I do think that there are, we are lagging. Um, thank God we have Dina, and you know, hopefully Dina will be the next CEO of Goldman Sachs. We'd love that. Um, but the point of the matter is that I think a lot of progress has been made uh, in the financial services, and I think even now uh, there are not many sectors that are sort of ring fence where women can't participate. We have a good friend who's running GSK, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies, um, Emma Walmsley. And so I am optimistic, fundamentally optimistic. The governments are being run by more women. The ECB, the, which next week is going to decide on whether or not to put in a rate cut, an additional cut in rates, or what they're going to do in target lending, um, is run by Christine Lagarde. The IMF was run by her before. Her replacement is a woman. I mean, we could go New on New York Stock on. Exchange is run by a woman exactly. now. Exactly. As is NASDAQ. I mean, let's, let's just focus on the positive. This is our time. Let's buckle down and be positive. Um, I'm sure Dina has better, more articulate comments than that. <laughs> Not more than Dan B. Um, You know, it's interesting. I, I do think we are, as I said earlier, making great strides. But I think there are certain pockets, which is the, the funding of female enterprises. I think that may be actually going, you know, in the wrong direction, even if it's edging up a bit, because it's just taking way too long. And so I think in that case, we just have to be more aggressive and deliberate, which means creating funds that are just focused on female enterprises and diverse enterprises. And so at Goldman, we actually launched something called uh, Goldman Sachs Launch, which is a $500 million fund. And we've already deployed $250 million. So that tells you there's quite a lot of amazing ideas out there that diverse African-American, Latino, uh, and female entrepreneurs are running. And you know what's, what's amazing is the team, St Stephanie Cohen at Goldman, who's running it, uh, is, is just amazed at what's out there. And we feel like, again, we're doing this because we want to be first in line for these ideas. And uh, the returns you know, really are starting to speak for themselves. Similarly, Jean and Steve Case have started a fund called Rise of the Rest, uh, which is uh, purposely not looking in Silicon Valley and New York. Uh, if you can believe it, something like 80%, I believe, of funding uh, is in Silicon Valley or New York. And so great places like Texas and Tennessee and Missouri and Ohio have amazing uh, entrepreneurs that need to be invested in and lifted up. And so I, I think we can't leave it to chance. I think we have to celebrate leaders who are actually making this a priority, but frankly, more important than that, allocating the much needed capital. I would just add, um, Sally Krawcheck as well has a, f a female-only um, fund, and so there are many ideas out there, and they are talking about the numbers, as Dina intimated. What's your cost of capital? What are the returns? And you, you can lead with that message now, because they are genuinely making important returns and putting a dent in an area that's been generally neglected. Great. Dina, you have worked with 10,000 business women in, in, with, at Goldman Sachs with 10,000 um, business, 10,000 women, 10,000 business. Um, any of those stories of female-led business owners that stand out for you that you tell around the dinner table? <laughs> yes. Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> because women are, uh, every single one of their stories is so inspirational. So um, we have two programs, 10,000 Women, which is the global effort in more than 50 countries reaching female entrepreneurs outside the United States, and then 10,000 Small Businesses, where we did let men in. And so it's men and women uh, business owners in uh, urban areas throughout the country. I, I, I think the story, though, that resonated the most with me after all these years is the story of a woman uh, in Afghanistan, Rangina Hamidi. We decided to invest in Afghanistan despite you know, understandable risk because we felt that you can't have a program called 10,000 Women and not go to the very hardest places because it's so easy for people to say, no matter what you do here, it's not gonna make a difference. And so this entrepreneur, Rangina, owned a company called Kandahar Treasures where she would go to the most conservative places throughout Afghanistan where women were still not allowed to leave their homes and help them sell handicraft that they made inside their homes, you know, bracelets and rugs and scarves. And one day she went to Bamiyan, which is probably the most conservative province, which is still controlled by the Taliban. And a woman that she worked with grabbed her hand at the door. She said, Rangina, my husband has never respected me. My husband has never asked my opinion on any matter. But ever since I started making a teeny bit of income, suddenly he's asking me questions. Like last week when he said, I don't believe in girls' education, but I guess I should ask your opinion since we have five daughters. <laughs> she so smartly said to him, you're right. I have failed you by bearing you only daughters and no sons. 
you're going to have to work your whole life <laughs> to provide a dowry for each of these girls when they are 12 and 13 and 14 years old. But if we force them to go to school, like me, they will learn a trade and make money <laughs> to take care of you. <laughs> and that, that husband looked at her and he said, you are right. We will force them to go to school. Sure enough, those five girls went to primary school. We followed them. They even went to secondary school, which is nearly unheard of. And the lesson that I took from that was that there is nowhere in the world that when a woman becomes economically independent that she can't change the course of the future of her family. Yes. Love that. Love that. As we wrap up, for both of you, I think um, there's a lot of inspirational, amazing, entrepreneurial women leaders in, in, in this room, whether they want to start their own business or they want to be the top, run their company, or they want to be on boards. What is your one piece of advice that these women can take away today? Ambisa? I would just say keep at it. Um, you know, I uh, keep at it and see you at the top. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> Dina? You know, I, I would um, say something that adds to what Dambisa was saying earlier. Be prepared. Be the best in the room when you show up. They're not expecting it. And, you know, I, I had the privilege of, of working for Condoleezza Rice for many years. Let me tell you something. She showed up in every part of the world so freaking prepared and impressive, and she taught me that. So, you know, read the material. Understand it. Ask for how you should present the best. Knowing your content, knowing your stuff makes you stand out. And I, I have to say that has been something that has really helped me. Thank you so much. Jim B. Dina, thank you.